The Health Fix Podcast teaches you how to take charge of your health naturally by giving you the information you need to elevate your health. Hello there, health junkies. Welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krauss, and on today's episode, I'm interviewing Don Joseph Gowie. We're going to be talking about awareness and negative thoughts. Did you know that 80% of your thoughts during the day are negative? And you've been programmed to think this way, which sucks because this is what is causing us to feel unhappy, to be unsatisfied with life, to not be able to get past ourselves to get what we want in life. So today we're going to help you to understand what it is about awareness, what it is about your thoughts, and what you can change to rewire your brain. In this episode, we are going to be talking about Anthony DeMello's book that Don actually edited. It's called Stop Fixing Yourself, Wake Up All Is Well. And then we'll also talk about some of Don Coey's resources like The End of Stress. So buckle up. We are going to help you to rewire your brain. Let's get on to the podcast. Hello there, health junkies. I have Don Joseph Gowie on with me, and we are going to be talking about one of my favorite topics. The concept of how you do not need to fix yourself. Searching over and over and over again for this concept of that you're broken, that you're not whole, that there's something wrong. This is this is a big thing I see in my practice, and I can't wait to talk to Don a little bit more about it and gain some insight. So, Don, welcome to the Health Fix. Well, thank you for having me. So I just mentioned the big bombshell here of fixing yourself. And and a lot of people will come into my office and say, Doc, you got to fix me. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. I've seen 25 different doctors, eight specialists, and I've done, you know, eight different rounds of psychotherapy and, and I can't seem to find the fix. And coincidentally enough, my podcast is called The Health Fix, but it's more on the concept of being a junkie for finding health information. And so this this concept of fixing yourself, where do you yeah. think that came about? And, and psychologically, where where are we at when we're at a point where we think we have to fix ourselves? And, and let's start there a little bit. Well, you know, Anthony DeMello said the very same thing you said. Um, you know, he was a psychologist. He trained under Carl Rogers. He's also a Jesuit priest. Um, and he said that the question that people asked him the most was, what do I need to do to change? Mm-hmm. And DeMello said, I, I've got a big surprise for you. Uh, his answer was nothing. He said the trouble with most people is that they're so busy trying to fix things inside themselves that they they. they they are things that they don't actually understand. And as a result, they kind of uh, make a bigger mess of things than where, from where they started. Um, you know, the, the problem that most people are struggling with at, at whatever level they're struggling with it is, has to do with happiness, has to do with fulfillment. You know, it's only about 4% of the population that say they are completely happy that they're happy from the time they wake up, they're happy throughout the day, they're happy when things go well, they're happy when things don't go so well. And um, the rest of us, 96% are struggling with it. And the irony is that we were born happy, we were born free, but we've become trapped in our own limited thinking. We were born with an open heart that stress and fear so easily closed. You know, we allow stress and fear to close it so easily. And we're born gifted human beings of a measurable, immeasurable worth. But we often feel like we're not good enough. So, and on top of all of that, you know, there there is this divinity that all the mystics and saints t- tell us about, a divinity of joy uh, with around us, within us, that would make our life meaningful and happy and fulfilling but we've been, we've become blocked from seeing it. You know, it's Demello says it's as if we're all hypnotized to see what's not there and not see what is there, and it all comes from the way in which we were programmed by society. We're we're essentially programmed by society to be unhappy 
and I, I'm happy to go into that with you. That's the essential problem. And so the if you're looking for an answer for you know to to uh, for for your your life to open up in a more fulfilling way, um, then then the work that you have in front of you is to deprogram yourself. You're okay, just like uh, like you were saying, you're not broken. Um, if there's a problem, it's the way you were programmed to believe that without something or some person or some result, you can't be happy. And it's a false belief, you know, and yet people go, go pursue, they, you know, go seeking their happiness out there in the world. It's kind of like that old song, looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> we don't acquire or earn happiness or peace. We have it already. And what, what our challenge is, is to drop the false beliefs. Um, and as we do that, the struggle that we have with the world, with our life drops and peace and happiness arise all, arise all by itself. You know, all is well, essentially, because you are, even, even if everything remains a mess, you're, 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 you're all is well with you. I think that's an interesting concept that I, where I'm at in life right now, can totally accept and be like, yeah, it is that way. But I could see a lot of people who are maybe working through some trauma that they've experienced, or perhaps life just hasn't been that great for them. I mean, I think for a lot of people, COVID has been super hard and in, in, in many different aspects and ways. And, and they might be thinking to themselves, okay, all is well with me. Well, I have this much amount of debt. I have this much amount of extra weight on me. I have this much different things. So these are all thoughts, correct? Yes. And so exactly. thoughts can take us down some really, really dark pathways. And and in your work, you talk a lot about rewiring the brain, helping us to kind of take ourselves out of these negative thought patterns. So if we go back to the concept of all is okay, even though there's chaos around me in terms of my life, my thoughts, where would someone begin to really start the process of, of convincing themselves or, or truly believing that all is okay? When, if you look at the outside experience, which you said, Jamela, you know, we see what we see is pretty, you know, to anybody would be like, wow, that's awful. This person has awful situation. You know, um, Victor Frankl wrote a wonderful book. I recommend it to everybody. Uh, he was an influence on Tony DeMello, certainly been an influence on me in my life. Uh, he, he founded the fourth school of, of um, psychotherapy, the fourth Viennese school of psychotherapy. He was a student of Freud and a Jew. And um, he and his wife ended up in Nazi concentration camps and, and they were divided and she ended up dying. And he spent the duration of the war in Auschwitz um, in that horror. And he came out of that experience and, and uh, with, with this message for the world, uh, he, became, he became very famous. And his message was that you can take everything from a man or a woman, but one thing, and that's the, their power to choose their own way in any given set of circumstances the power to choose their own attitude. And he said that when you find yourself in a situation that you can't change, like COVID, then the challenge that's on you is to change yourself. And the first step that you take in, in changing yourself is to begin to understand some of this programming. You know, how it is you got to be... Uh, you got to be trapped in, you know, inside the walls of your own negativity, inside the walls of negative thinking, inside the walls of pessimism, inside the walls of fear. Um, when you take a look at it, you begin to, you you begin to understand how um, what's been stamped into you is this belief about happiness and your own self worth um, that 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 have been that society has imposed on you, um, and that that uh, programming has turned you into the seeker that never finds what you're looking for. You know, and what society tells us, it's out there in the world. 
You know, that if we work hard and long hours, success will come. And out of that, happiness and fulfillment and dignity will follow. And we've all swallowed that formula. Um, and, you know, 10, 20 years later, we realize that success has come without fulfillment. And that's when they show up at, in your office. They show up in mine for, for coaching. They show up at psychologists having what's called the midlife crisis. And actually, millennials are having it sooner yeah. than, than the, my baby boomer generation. So, you know, success without fulfillment, that's failing at life. That's failing at living. Yeah. Uh, I think it was uh, Tony Robbins said, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. So waking up from that programming, that nightmare, is the realization that contrary to what society has taught us, nothing, but absolutely nothing of the world can make you happy, can bring you happiness. Success, of course, it's important, but success is not the same as fulfillment. Fulfillment doesn't come from the world. Happiness doesn't come from the world. And you got to get that straight or you're going to spend your whole life chasing you're chasing around in circles. And I'm talking, when I talk about happiness, I'm talking about the radiant happiness of a child, you know, that's constant, that makes you smile for no reason. And, and you know, one of the um, main tenets of this book, Stop Fixing Yourself, is that notion is that uh, happiness comes from within you. The truth is there's not a single moment in your life when you don't have everything that you need to be happy. And the only reason we're ever unhappy is because we're focusing on what we don't have rather than on what we have right here, right now. And this this book, Stop Fixing Yourself, that um, and, and DeMello's teachings, um, they're about, they're, they're, it's there to help you rediscover that truth about yourself and it's an incredible truth to wake up to <laughs> yeah i mean it, it truly it truly is and and part of i think for us us folks that are in midlife crisis status and and millennials getting a little closer to that at younger ages i mean i'm in my 40s um, mid 40s and starting to realize you know a lot of things in the last couple years that, oh, wait, I had this all wrong. That whole all work and no play concept, you know, to try to get to, to this monetary achievement. How's that work out for me? Not so great. Did it make me happy? No. Did it make me, you know, feel fulfilled? It actually made me hate what I was doing. I mean, it made me hate being a doctor because I was hustling to try to get so many patients to get a certain amount of money to get whatever imaginary thing that I thought I was going to be happy with. And, and you know, so your, your identity tied up in that. And so when your identity gets tied up in that, what follows is the fear of failing. And and that's that's misery. And that runs your life, you know, and that makes you feel like you're not doing enough. You have to do more. You have to struggle harder. Um, and, but it, the whole time we're going through that, those gyrations of the truth of our, our, our being, the truth of our, our soul, our spirit um, is still profoundly present. You know, we're not broken. We're not some problem to be solved. We're okay. And if there's a problem, it's the way we've been programmed again to believe that without something or person or result, we're not going to be happy. And it's a false belief. So you drop that false belief and the struggle with the world drops. And what begins, what you begin to notice is that th this experience that you're hoping to, to have by achieving something out there in the world, this experience of happiness, of joy, of elation, of self-worth, it begins to arise all by itself from within you, irrespective of how much you succeeded or failed. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've coached people who um, succeeded unbelievably in the world, famous for the success that they've made. Um, their, their wealth is enormous. They can buy anything they wanted. And they, they were miserable. They they didn't they hadn't experienced peace or happiness in so long that 
they weren't even sure it was the, the peace and happy. I think one guy told me the peace and happiness is something you psychologists make up to, to attract clients. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this world, there's no peace. There's no happiness in this world. That's, that's how dissociated he was from it. And, uh, um, and you know, it, it reflected in the way he related to other people, you know, so, and then on the other side of the equation, my wife, she went off to Burma a few years ago. She went way out into, she's a sociologist, she went at, way out into the um, countryside of Burma and um, into a village. And she spent a day with this, this woman who lived in um, pretty much what we consider a shack, um, didn't have any plumbing of any kind, dirt floor. And my wife said she was the happiest person that she ever met. And yet by our standards, she had nothing. By our standards, we wouldn't call her life a success. But by, by, by a whole other standard, she's living an incredibly fulfilling life. And what's fulfilling it? She is. She's fulfilling it. And so you have these two, these two images, you know, of the wealthy um, billionaire who is miserable and the person who has very meager possessions who's happy. And you got to figure it out. I mean, wh what's the difference between these two people? And the difference is one of attitude. That's the difference. One is empowering an attitude that's delivering the quality of inner life that we're all reaching for. And the other is looking out outside himself for it and not finding it to the extent that he doesn't even believe it exists. So that's that's a starting point. Is if you don't get that clear, you know, you're going to keep looking around outside. And what DeMello provides is a very direct way of deprogramming yourself. Couldn't actually, it couldn't be simpler. <laughs> so this is what I want to hear about is, is the deprogramming yourself, the, the rewiring, if you will, the changing, you know, the thought process. Now, yeah. I first think I need to back up though, because I want folks to kind of understand your connection to all of this, because obviously we're talking about a book that is from Anthony DeMello and you are the executive director of the DeMello um, Spirituality Center. And so I, th I would love folks to kind of understand a little bit about how you became familiar with DeMello's work and how it transformed you. And then brought you to where you are today. And then we're going to start talking about how that rewiring process works. Cause okay. I know everyone wants to know about that too. <laughs> that sounds like a good plan. Well, the way I came into working with the DeMello Spirituality Center was a philanthropist came to the center, uh, to the board of trustees and said that he, he wanted to, to provide funding for the center to reach out even further into the world and bring DeMello and his message even further out to people. And um, Anthony DeMello's books, uh, you know, he died in 1987. And yet his impact on this field that I'm working in, psycho uh, spirituality, has been immense. I mean, he's influenced people like Eckhart Tolle, and uh, his books continue to be bestsellers. And this philanthropist um, had been deeply moved by Anthony's work. And, and, and he wanted to contribute to it. So they did a national search and they um, were looking for somebody that could do that. And uh, they found me. And so, and the way I came into this field uh, years and years ago, this field of psychospirituality uh, was the hard way, actually. Um, years ago, I experienced what you might call a perfect storm of stress. Um, I had an executive, high level executive position at Stanford University Medical School uh, that I devoted a, a decade, maybe more, climbing the career ladder to get to. And, um, and I lost my job. Um, I butted heads with the chairman of the department and he got tired of my budding head and uh, he said, adios. And then, uh, and I was married with four children. Losing losing that job and that salary uh, was was frightening. And then nine days later, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor that the doctors warned 
could could leave me seriously disabled and potentially unable to work again just because of of the collateral damage from the surgery. And so um, suddenly, you know, my life was coming apart at the seams and it seemed there was nothing I could do to stop the impending catastrophe. And I was very much oriented to, to the, to life through my social program. You know, I was a, I was out for success. I was out to be famous. I was out to make a lot of money. And suddenly the whole game was falling apart. And um, I had to wait six weeks for the surgery. And the first two weeks were, were dreadful. You know, every night I'd wake up three o'clock in the morning, stare out the window into the cold, dark night, terrified by what was going to happen to me and my family. You know, we could we could end up homeless. It was a possibility. And about two weeks into this, one night, three o'clock in the morning, I reached this point where I seriously questioned which was worse, the, the dire problems the doctors predicted that might happen to me in the future, or the abject fear, the terror that was happening to me every day, and especially at these three clock in the morning episodes, you know, uh, and the answer was clear that the, the, the fear was, was absolutely worse. It was bone chilling fear that I was experiencing. It was consuming me and it was depleting, you know, the, the strength that, that I needed to get through what I had to, whatever it was I was going to have to get through. And um, so I, so I decided, you know, I, I knew of a, of a, an approach very similar to Anthony DeMello's. Actually, I learned it from Carl Rogers, who was his, one of his mentors. And it was a process um, uh, that involved being diligently aware of every fearful, negative, painful thing I was thinking and the pictures it was painting and the emotional state it was turning into and to really be willing uh, to feel and observe the thoughts driving all of it, the pain, the painful emotions that are coming from it. And uh, at, to my amazement, I was able to do that. At first, I thought, you know, if I go into this process, it'll clear up pretty quick. Well, no, it didn't. It swelled. All of that emotion that I'd been repressing suddenly whoo, loomed up, overwhelmed me. And so it was sort of like uh, my grandson describes, he tells me when he rides a wave, when you get on a big wave, once you're on it, you got to ride it to shore. There's no calling it off. And it was like an experience like that. Um, but as I went through, and, and there's a part in it where you say to yourself, this, this, um, this, this emotional pain that I'm in, this fear that I'm in, it's in me not necessarily in reality, I'm generating it. It's a very important step to take. And then not to judge yourself or condemn yourself for being fearful, another really important step to take, which I did. And then to remind yourself quietly, although it doesn't always help a lot when you're really in the, you know, right on top of that wave, it, but you remind yourself, this will pass, this will pass, this will be over even though it feels like it's it's going to it's been already lasting an eternity and it did it passed you know i don't know how long maybe 5 minutes of suffering and it passed and then i i conjured it all up again and i took it through that process again and it passed and a third time you know i don't know i can't remember how it was a long time ago this happened i can't remember how many times i did it but that i do remember there was a moment at which when it passed, I realized I was free, mm -hmm. not just free of, of the upset, free, absolutely free. And in a position through that freedom to, to choose whatever experience I wanted to have. And, and I could see from where I was sitting, you know, you kind of st you're standing when you go through this awareness process, you're standing back from all of the pain and commotion that you're going through and you're standing back over here. And when you get to that point where it passes and you're liberated, you look back and you realize that is not me. This is me. That is just some, that's a form of programming that I buy into. And, you know, I, my, it's my mind making up 
emergencies that my brain is believing are real and setting off these stress reactions, the anxiety reactions and the depression that follows them. And that's not me. And it's a very wonderful, liberating moment. And so I made up my mind right in there, you know, when it, at, at the end of that experience, I made up my mind that I was going to let go of fear and, and uh, stress in that simple way. Uh, between then and the time I went to surgery, uh, as I faced whatever I had to face day to day. And um, the surgery turned out to be a complete success. You know, the, the, um, it shouldn't have. And they presented me a grand rounds at Stanford Medical School. Um, that's when I found out that what a big deal it was that, you know, I came through this thing in whole. And, um, you know, if neuroscientists knew back then but they know now, and they didn't know it back then. They didn't even they didn't even buy into the mind body connection uh, back then. But what neuroscience would say, looking back, they would say your shift in attitude shift not only shifted you emotionally, it shifted you biochemically. It created that mind body connection that gave you the be- the, the optimum chance for a great outcome. And then it turned out I got my job back. I didn't get my that job back. Um, the chairman and I were never <laughs> going to see eye eye in that job. But there, the guy in psychiatry, the chairman of psychiatry, he wanted me to be his chief executive. He told me he said that I heard about this fellow going through this this catastrophe and with this incredible attitude. And he said, "I can tell you, we need we need somebody with that kind of attitude in this department." Mm-hmm. And so I got I got my my job back, and then a, a few years later I left Stanford and um, went out into the world looking for work that um, I could connect with. It was where my heart was by then through all for that spiritual experience, mm-hmm. and I ended up uh, at the Center for Attitudinal Healing, which was founded by Jerry Jampolsky who wrote Love is Letting Go of Fear. He founded a school of psychology based on attitude. And we worked with, we, he had developed a set of spiritual principles to bring to bear on catastrophic life events. So we worked with people facing some of the most stressful situations anybody faces in the world. People, um, it was the height of the AIDS epidemic. So we were working in that, working with people suffering with cancer, life threatened by cancer. ALS, other diseases, uh, worked with parents who had lost children. And the, the uh, U.S. State Department and Clinton's administration sent us into Croatia and Bosnia to work in the refugee camps to, with post-traumatic stress that, that people were suffering from that genocidal war. And in 2005, the center won, um, was awarded the Excellence in Medicine Award from the AMA. And... Um, because, because these spiritual principles work. And this process of awareness, as we step into it, works to create, the sh- to, to, to basically drop the veil that our programming has placed between us and reality and to open our hearts to the joy and well-being that's all around us and that's, and that's emanating from us. That is incredible. Well, first, the the getting over the the tumor in such a way that you did. I think one of the big things that we're looking at here is the psycho neuroimmunology component of of the mindset and the attitude and our thought processes. And so many people, I think, would maybe have even survived cancer my mom included, and this is why I'm going to bring it up because my mom passed away of cancer in in 2004. And she was probably one of the most spiritual people I had ever met until she started to go down the path of being fearful from all of the, the cancer talk and all of the treatment talk and this might happen or that might happen. And, and so fear like you had fear, like she had, fear like I see a lot of people have myself included about certain things really does seem to be one of the things at the root of quite possibly illness, like the intersection between psycho neuroimmunology, really our illness connection to 
our brain connection to our thoughts, connection to our immunology. Yes. Well, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, um, one of the things about fear is that it's what triggers stress reactions. You know, there's some form of fear needs to be present for the brain, uh, the amygdala, the fear center of the brain to launch us into, uh, you know, stress reaction and stress reactions. Um, when they're chronic, they create what's called fear conditioning. And then fear conditioning is when you continue to believe that there's a threat uh, present when no threat is actually present. It's all in your mind. Um, what happens is, is that your brain becomes fear conditioned and, and those lower parts of your brain, um, the emotional brain expands. They, they grow strong. And, I, and I, it's, it's, it's called uh, uh, sprouting. And the higher parts of your brain were logic and creativity and all those wonderful things that we are, that the, the, the dialogue between the right and left brain can produce. Those parts in the prefrontal cortex shrink. Mm. It's, called prune, it's called pruning. And so what they found is that, uh, I guess the most famous stress researcher is Robert Sapolsky at Stanford. And, you know, He's done an incredible body of, of research, and his conclusion is, is that we human beings are capable of producing all kinds of stress reactions purely in our heads that set off the incredible biological upset and mental upset, and it's all tied to mere thought. You know, at Cornell University, they did a, a study and they asked people to write down their worries over a you know, protracted period of time and then to go back over their di worry diary and, um, and add up the number of uh, worries that did not happen. And what they found is 85% of what people, of these people worried about didn't happen. And, you know, when I quote that, if I'm giving a keynote, I'll quote that. And somebody in the audience invariably raises their hand and says, well, what about the 15 percent that did? <laughs> and uh, and they actually drilled down into that. They actually did the looked into that and they found that uh, of that 15 percent where that worry did manifest, 79 percent of those people hand, found that they were had the resources to deal with it emotionally. Uh, monetarily, whatever the issue was, they they got through it. They got through it fine. They got to the other side of it, which meant when you did all of it together, the 85% with the 79% of the 15%, you end up with 97% of the time the people in that study who were worried, there was absolutely nothing to worry about. And yet, you know, people worry all the time. You know, they they pick up, uh, they go to their mailbox and they look at their mail and they, they walk into the house worried. They might've been happy if a few moments before um, or, you know, mildly happy, not anymore. Well, what they've discovered from, you know, if you take this even further, um, what, what fear does when it ignites the stress reaction, what that means is that you, your, your brain is activating um, the release of stress hormones into your system. And those stress hormones are what, what cause that emotional brain that, where your fear center is to expand. So you, you, you're, you're much, you got much more of a hairpin trigger into stress and anxiety and causes that part to shrink. That's coming from stress hormones. And then uh, Dr. Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize for this research, what she discovered is that those stress hormones were also toxic to your, to your chromosomes? That the what holds your chromosomes together? What you know, your chromosomes hold your DNA, and chromosomes they spiral, right? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the chromosomes, they have caps. They're called telomeres, and telomeres are like the caps on the end of a shoelace. They, you know, that cap on the end of a shoelace keeps the shoelace from unraveling. Well, the, the telomeres do the same thing for your, for your chromosomes. And what happens which, when you, you're flooded with stress hormones is it, it, it acts like almost like putting Clorox on a rose. It causes the deterioration of those caps. Your chromosomes unravel, starts putting out abnormal cells so that it, when, when you need something in your body repaired, you're getting weak cells doing the job and those abnormal cells 
also can express as cancer. And it's all tied together. It all, you know, you map it all the way back to the thoughts in your head. And so, and so you have to ask, well, why am I so fearful? Why am I such a worry work? Why am I um, anxious all the time? Why am I stressing? Why does the pandemic just overwhelming? Why is it overwhelming? And the answer to that, it's the, the way you've been programmed. You've been programmed to think that the world's unsafe. You've been programmed to be afraid. You've been programmed to seek what is essentially you outside of yourself and not to find and, and, and not to ever find it out there. And then you're programmed to blame yourself for not finding it. And then so what you do is you run to the, you know, whoever psychotherapist is hot or whatever workshop is hot or whatever. And, um, and it's all, all, all it's a question of is deprogramming yourself from the way, the way in which you re you've been programmed to be so reactive in these ways mentally. And the way in which you deprogram yourself is through this simple process of awareness that I just described to you um, that I went through. Um, and that's what Anthony DeMello um, is, is so well known for. You know, what Anthony DeMello says is that where you've got to start is by becoming aware of all the, neg the negativity that's running your life, these thoughts that are running your life, the thoughts that are determining your health and your well-being, these thoughts that are determining whether your, your relationships flourish or don't, all of that. You've got to embrace the negativity. And most of us, um, you know, you got to get up close. You got to you got to be willing to feel what's going on inside of you. And most people aren't, particularly men. Um, but you got to do it. And sometimes, the, if, if if you want to get free of it all, that's what you got to do. You can't change what you don't see. And uh, one of the famous one of the quotes Demel is famous for is, "What you are aware of, you control." What you, you know, like me, when I got back into that moment where I experienced freedom from all, freedom from what? Not the world, freedom from all the thoughts and crazy emotions that were going on inside of me that, I that were defining me, that I was identifying as me, that were not me at all. You, you, you've, got to, you've got to meet those. You've got to make them your friends. And the way in which you make them your friends is through awareness. So what you are aware of, you control. What you're unaware of, controls you. And that's, that's the starting place. And oftentimes when I'm working with people, um, I invite them to begin by not being afraid of being afraid or not being stressed by being stressed or not being ashamed of feeling shame, you know, just to kind of ease up to it and then to drop in and to allow yourself to embrace what you're feeling without the need to change it into something better or to get rid of it or to make it over in, in any way, shape or form, just to, to be present with it, just to be with what, with what's going on inside of you. And then again, reminding yourself, uh, this is happening in me, this commotion, this upset, it's in me, not in reality. Reality is fine. Reality is neutral. Reality is just being reality. I'm, my, the relationship I'm coming in into with reality is this upset. That's in me. And to see the truth of that. And the, the more you do it, the more you will see it. And then not to judge yourself. It's very important to be non-judgmental in this process. And if you're being non-judgmental, process that. Notice the judgmental thoughts you're thinking, the names that you're calling yourself, uh, you know, the, the criticisms that, that you're lodging against yourself and the, and the emotional state it brings about, the unhappiness it brings about in you, the, the feeling of inadequacy and insecurity that it arises. That it, you can begin to see how out of that inadequacy and insecurity, you've spent your life trying to to uh, win people over and trying to, you know, fit in. And, and you've been selling yourself out, you know, trying to, to be approved of by other people. And you feel that 
how and then the, <laughs> you begin to understand is that as you're doing that as you're seeking everybody somebody else's or everybody else's approval everybody else is trying to get your approval too and we're all insecure you know because it doesn't come from outside of us you begin to see these things you begin to understand them you begin to see them the more you do this you begin to see them in the people in your lives that you love your friends when they're in distress and you it, it becomes a source of compassion from you that you extend to other people, but it's also, it becomes a source of kind of a mirror. So you begin to see yourself and you stop judging other people, stop judging yourself. Um, and then that's where, when compassion arises in and of itself. And then you get to that point where you, where you keep telling yourself, this too will pass and suddenly it's gone. You know, everything passes especially emotions, they come and go like, like a swarm of bees, right? Mm -hmm. And so everything passes. And when they pass, you're, you're free to be in the present moment. And in the present moment, you will discover, if you haven't already, that, that there's always freedom in the present moment. There's always peace. And in fact, in the present moment, it arises naturally all by itself because happiness is your natural state. You know, you don't have to go out and get it. it. It's like it was, it was, it's in your spiritual DNA. You were born with it and it doesn't leave you. You, you can block it. You can block the presence of happiness and love and peace, but it doesn't leave you. And when you get the block out of the way, which is, you know, what's going on up here, it, it arises all by itself. And now pretty soon, you know, you, you're walking down the street and you stop and suddenly you feel happiness for no reason you can identify. Or you're walking down the street and suddenly out of the blue, you feel love for everybody you see. You know, just, just agape love for everybody that you see. That's When that happens, that's called waking up. You're waking up. And that's what DeMello is getting to in this book, in all of his books. I, I like the topic, wake up all as well. And, and really becoming aware, the waking up, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, is, is becoming aware of, of yourself and your feelings. And I think for a lot of people, we try to numb those feelings. We try to, you know, overcompensate. You know, there's multiple different ways of, of going about the feelings of fear, the feelings of... We repress, of, we push them away. Right, right. So I can imagine... And then we go running to you and say... You got to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> fix, fix me, Doc. That's that's uh, when I hear that. It's it's always the uh oh, fix me. Uh uh, we're gonna we're gonna help you fix yourself here, and we're gonna do it in a different manner. And you know this this whole concept of it, we're gonna help you. I'm gonna be the catalyst to help you change. Is really you know that's a lot right. of, a lot of the. You can just say to them, "There's nothing to fix. There, there's just some programming you need to drop. And when you drop that programming." What it is you're looking for will arise all by itself. Like and you got to, and uh, you, maybe in the beginning, you may have a little bit of faith in this, but you got to try it. You got to step into something, you know, and, uh, and I can tell you from four decades of, of working with people around psychology and spirituality, most recently around neurology uh, or neuroscience, um, this process works. Mm -hmm. This is what works. I, I wholeheartedly believe in the process. I, I wholeheartedly do. And, and for so many people out there that I'm seeing issues with fear connected to this, I mean, fear is kind of the big, the hot one that I see on, on a lot of levels and, and the stress that comes with the fear, the effect on the vagus nerve and, and how this all kind of snowballs. And so I definitely was when, when you were pitched to me to come on the podcast, I was like, yes, please. Um, because this is, you know, folks who are listening right now, I mean, this is really legit stuff. I'm, I'm not speaking because I've got Don on the line here and saying this, this is stuff that I've used on myself to help myself because even like a year ago, I was a very miserable individual and starting to become aware of all of the things that, I have programmed and my parents and my family and friends programmed into me because I pull off of other people. And I would agree. I would bet you would agree, Don, that we also have some of our programming from what we heard from our parents, from what we heard from our caregivers, oh, yeah. grandparents. And, and, some this, sure. and some of this goes pretty darn, darn deep 
into our, our soul, if you will, as to how we interact and see the world. And so what I would love to hear from you in terms of, of telling folks a little bit more, because I know a lot of folks are like, yeah, I can read a book, but, and, and I'll get the concepts, but the practice is what I always am enforcing and, and not enforcing, but like reemphasizing or emphasizing in, in my office on a daily basis. Do you have practice awareness to keep this going? Is it an everyday thing? Yes. It's an every moment thing. <laughs> every moment. Right. It's enough for you to be aware. It's enough for you to simply observe. It's enough for you to, you know, muster up the courage to feel what you feel, to get close to those negative feelings, those upsetting feelings, those fearful feelings, to feel them, to really feel them, to let them up. It's interesting. It's kind of a way in which um, I've experienced it is that when I resist what I'm feeling, you know, it's uncomfortable, push it away. I don't want anything to do with it. My messed upness, you know, um, that when I push it away, it sort of hits trigger points in me, you know, things from the past, disappointments, you know, you know how you can do, you, you, you start out with uh, this is wrong and you're thinking about that and then this is wrong and then somebody says something to you and that's wrong and you're just in this, you know, it's like Bob Dylan says, well, something's not right, it's wrong, you know, <laughs> and, and, and you're suffering and and then the worst part of it, you think that the suffering is being imposed on you by by the world, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's happening to you, not in you. And so you're you're stuck. You know, you, you have this feeling of being lost. And it may be deep seated, but it doesn't matter how deep seated it is, because like that, it can disappear because this larger reality of you, this your soul, um, is sitting here watching the whole thing that's happening completely at peace in an expanded place, trying its best to, to guide us along and, you know, and, and tripping us here and there. And so I find that when I'm resisting it, I can't see anything. I can't see what, see my way clear from it. And so I'm trapped in it. And so it becomes like a prison. You know, you and you're tra everybody knows what that feels like when you're trapped in your own thoughts and you can't get out of them, you know, and no matter what anybody says, people can say to their blue in their face, it's going to be OK. It's not that bad. And you, and you go, I hear what you're saying, but I, 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 I just I just can't take it in. You know, I'm, I'm too frightened. Well, yeah, you're too frightened. Well, what happens on the flip side of that is when I allow it, myself to embrace it. What, give you an example. One day I was walking down the the uh, hallway, and um, and I was fine. You know, I was in a good mood that morning, and I'm walking down the hallway, and suddenly I get this feeling, this sort of uh, general sort of out of the blue feeling that something's wrong, and that not only that something's wrong, it's wrong because I did something wrong. And it's not only that, but it's going to lead to some kind of punishment. Somebody's going to bust me for this. And, and then I noticed my whole uh, mood and attitude really began to sink into the marsh, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, if you're practicing awareness, um, you catch it. Ah, I actually... I actually have fun with it now. It used to be really hard to do and miserable. I actually have fun with it. So I can't, aha, something's going on here. Well, it wasn't just something that was going on here. That got programmed into me back in my childhood. I had a, a, a violent stepfather, uh, a very abusive verbally, physically. And that was his message to me and to my brothers, you know, that, that there's something wrong with you. You know, you, you, he had he used foul language to describe what he thought we were. And, 
we, he, you know, he, he hit us with it so much it ingrained. Yeah. And the idea was you, it didn't matter with my stepfather, if you ever did anything wrong or not, he, that wasn't the point. The point was he's, he, his sadistic mind was going to come, had reason to cut, gave himself reason to come after you. Right. And this thing here, I am um, probably in my late fifties and I'm seeing it for the first time. And I'm realizing this has been there the whole darn journey. You know, this is, and I've reacted from this place, you know, and I become defensive from this place so that anybody says to me, um, I, I used to say to people all the time, I'm not to blame for this. Are you, is that what you're suggesting? Because I'm not to blame for this. Well, I wasn't talking to them. I was talking to my stepfather, right? And so this moment walking down the hallway, I caught it. And I let, and I sat down, I let myself feel it. I cried. Yeah, I couldn't help it. I didn't cry from feeling um, defeated like, like I had before. I just cried. I mean, it was, it was tears that had, I hadn't allowed myself to, to cry because I always pushed it away. I mean, who wants to feel that? Who wants to feel that, that ancient, you know, you're, you're worthless kind of feeling. Well, I had trained myself to want to feel that because I know it's the way it's, there's no way around it, only through it. And, um, and I stayed with that for the next year and a half. And my problem with self esteem, my problem with shame, um, really quieted way, way down. None of the stuff goes away. I mean, your brain it stays wired in your brain, but when when you when you change the pattern within your brain, it either um, strengthens synapses or it weakens them. So those synapses that used to be really strong and really clever and really unconscious, you know, what you are unaware of controls you and really controlling of my mood, quieted way way down. And um, now I. The other day I did a, a workshop and uh, with, with my associate and the, the um, uh, reviews, the, what do you call it, the evaluations came in, you know, and they, they were, they were really good valuations, but there was one person who had to get, had something they had to get off their chest, you know, and it was, it was pretty uh, negative. It wasn't nasty, but it was negative, you know, and those years ago, those would have, had me right by the throat. I would have, they would have blotted out anything good anybody would have said. And my whole focus would have gone then, there. And I would have been in that narrow little cage, you know? And um, I, I understood, I under, instead I understood what this person, where she was coming from. I really understood it. It had nothing to do with me. And I understood that too. And I felt compassion for where she was stuck. Uh, and I would have helped her but the workshop was over, you know, and, um, and that was it. And I can tell you, I mean, to some, it may not sound like much, but that was a huge change transformation inside of me that now it's natural. You know, I don't trash myself. And that's what mastery is. The more you do that, the more you work with awareness, the more it serves you so that it's, it's like this, uh, uh, guy, what's his name? Yeshiba, who started Aikido. He was doing an Aikido demonstration once with a friend. Uh, a friend of mine attended, and my friend said, "Every all the students said it was perfect." And this guy is, you know, he's the Picasso of Aikido. He's the founder, and so they said it was perfect. You didn't make one mistake, and he laughed. He said, "I made several mistakes." He said, "But I correct them so fast, you didn't see them." <laughs> well, that's what awareness will do for you. You know, now when that shame feeling comes up, something sparks it, you know, I meet it and I process it really quickly. And by the time I get to the end of the hallway, it's gone. You know, I'm not even, it's, it's, and it's not, my mood hasn't been changed as a result of it. So that's, that's what the Mel is bringing to us. That's the message that he's bringing to us. And of so much of he, he he talks about a lot of other things. He talks about it, you know. Everybody asks him what, uh, how do I find God? His answer to that 
is you'll, the only place you and God ever meet is in silence. And, and he'll tell you about God. God is in everything. Every, everything around you is God. And everything around you is the, loving God, the love of God loving you. But you can, but you know, we have these blocks to love. Move the blocks to love, and you see it. The flowers are loving you. The trees, the wind is loving you. Your debts, people. You were talking about people who say, "I I can't be happy until I'm out of debt." Yeah. And so here, I'll give your viewers one thing they can do aside the, the the awareness that will really help them is they make a take out a blank piece of paper, right, and at the top of it you write, "I cannot." be happy unless or until I cannot be happy unless or until and you start writing things down. And uh, people, people, most people are really surprised at how quickly they come up with, well, I, yeah, until I'm out of debt until, until my spouse agrees that I'm right, she's wrong or he's wrong. You know, it goes on and on until my boss appreciates me until I get that promotion, until I get that degree, until it just goes on and on and on. And then I tell people to look at it. These, this is what all the mystics and saints are calling attachments. These are attachments. An attachment is anything that, you, that any belief that you have that you cannot be happy without this thing or this person or this result. And you make that list. And then I tell people, behold your suffering. There it is. That's it. The, and none of it's true. You can, one thing people will say, I can't be happy without my neurosis. Yes, you can. <laughs> Believe me, I'm happy and I'm as neurotic as it gets. Most of the, the mystics and um, saints, they were, they were really not neurotic people. They just didn't identify with their neurosis. You know, their brains got programmed just like we have. They have their own little knee jerk reactions. Um, so, you do those two things, you know, get, get to understand attachments, drop your attachments. And what, what will arise is this feeling of freedom. You know, I'm free, right? I, you think I'm going to be free, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be, everything will be ha happy and wonderful when uh, my baldness stops <laughs> or everything will be happy and, and wonderful when I get married or when I get this, you know, all of that. And we all know, <laughs> that all of those things you could get check every one of the boxes and there's no guarantee at the end of that you're going to be happy because it doesn't come from those things it comes from here from you and that's the discovery that that's what everybody is reaching for and and the thinking it is out there and it's not until we turn around and come back in here like Ram Dass said he said we should be wearing glasses that have instead of <laughs> Look, you look through, they have mirrors. So you look back inside. That's what you need to shift. Mm -hmm. So I hope those two things help people. They, they've helped me enormously. And I know hundreds, thousands of people they've helped. I think it's incredible. I think it's incredible work. I've worked on it myself and, and continue to on a daily basis and have seen quite a bit of change within myself. So, and, and my patients that I've, I've, got to buy into to working on the the concept of awareness and I, I think this is this is such an important topic to be shared something that I think as a world we could get a lot further if we started to pay a little bit more attention to ourselves and our thoughts and and become more aware of what's triggering us what's triggering us to to go off the rails is is what I use in in my terminology in my office but I think this is huge and I think one of the things that I want to kind of end on in terms of the concept that you had mentioned and and I think for people who are very let's put it this way, they need some data or they need something to think about when they're working on the concept of improving their awareness and rewiring their brain. The fact that you can work on strengthening certain synapses in the brain to think one direction and then get those other ones that have been keeping you in the fear state, keeping you in the self-loathing state, keeping you in the victimhood state, you can suppress those. You can't get rid of them. That's a lovely explanation that you gave because I think a lot of people start to think, well, can I just, can I just get rid of them? No, no, they don't. They, you know, they get rid of themselves eventually when they no longer serve you, mm -hmm. you know, and 
if you have a thought system that believes that um, the the world's out to get you, um, your your life is going to be spent running. You know, I mean, it's just it just follows until you wake up that uh, that the only things that's out to get you is your own thoughts, and you don't even have to suppress them. You just have to they'll, they'll drop. They will will eventually drop. The synapses, you know, they, they, they'll they stick their head up. But it used to be, you know, they just devoured you, right? No, they don't. They come up, you look at them, you go, I'm gonna, you know, process it quickly through awareness, they're gone. They drop. And, um, you know, it, it's a, it's also changing your whole relationship with the hard things in your life. Uh, you know, how you see them um, matters greatly. Mm -hmm. If you see if you see them as obstacles and as ju as proof of your own inadequacy, and you know th you see them in that kind of dark light, sure. um, they 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 hang around for a long time, right? But if you begin to see them as um, they're there trying to teach you something, you know whatever whatever it is. I was talking talking with um, somebody recently about um, they they wanted to get rid of a fear that they had, and I told them I said what if what if you that fear without that fear you wouldn't grow, because everybody will tell you the older that they get the more they understand that what they thought was once a curse turned out to be the greatest blessing in their life. I'm one of those with that brain tumor. I never would have made that shift. It. You know, I was so stubborn. It, I had to put my universe had to put my face in it. Look how much fear you are running, you know, and look what happens when you're willing to do something simple to let it go, you know. And so, you know, that's another thing that's in this book that DeMello talks about is that um, your perspective matters greatly in the perspective you bring even to your suffering and how you see it. And how and the way in which you describe it to yourself um, is really important because you're, you're suffering in so many ways as your friend. You know we are pretty stubborn, and this program and that happens to us is pretty intense. You know it, it's been it's been stamped into us. You know literally right into our brains, and so you know, it's it's important to understand that as we begin to wake up and the, the pain that we go through in waking up, um, that's our friend. And we and and with, for whatever reason, we don't wake up without it. You know, it's suffering that finally goes, there must be another way. There must be a better way for me to live my life than like this. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't, and then now you're open. Now you're open to possibility of, of, a shift occurring in your life until that moment um, you, you were stuck. And who, who do you got to thank for it? The, the suffering that made you say, uncle, I've had enough, enough already. Now I take responsibility for it. I have enough blaming other people. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's on me. It's on me. No, that that's huge. That's huge. And I think, I think that's kind of one of the, the great things to, one of the first steps really is, is starting to own, I, I call it in my office, owning your shit and yes. really making that connection there is. And then, and then you move to a point is, is never thought I'd ever be saying this 30, 40 years ago. It moves to a point from owning your shit to loving your shit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to loving the force it has been in your life, trying to wake you up. Yeah. And then you move from that to loving your life. You know, people talk about, I want to be whole. And if you ask them, what do you mean by whole? And they, you know, they, they start sounding something that sounds like Buddha or Jesus, you know. <laughs> and you want to say, good luck with that. And But the truth of the matter is, whole means everything. It means your strengths, your gifts. It also means your foibles, your weaknesses, your fears. That's whole. And wholeness, come, that feeling of wholeness comes when you embrace it all and and love it all, you know, and move with it all in a way that is waking up, that is that is conscious, consciously moving forward with, with 
with the whole ball of wax, with the whole <laughs> ball of wax and loving it. And suddenly being in debt isn't, isn't terrifying you and, and oppressing you anymore. Everybody's in debt. Mm-hmm. One way or the other. One, One way, way or the other. other. Yeah. Even billionaires. Mm-hmm. They, they mm-hmm. have extraordinary amounts of debt. <laughs> but they, they're they not afraid of it. That's That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. And not being afraid to make change. I think that's kind of the big overarching theme that I'd love folks to get from from this podcast. Wake up. Everything's okay. All is well, just like the book. And and really just don't be afraid to make change. It could be right. You won't you won't die from allowing yourself to be aware of your feelings. Mm -hmm. What you're feeling. You won't die from allowing yourself to be aware of the negative thinking that's going on in your head. You know, we all got a a serial killer in there. We all got a sex maniac in there. I mean, we, we, how could we not look at, look at the the amount of stuff Hollywood pro is programming into our heads where the news is programming into our heads. We're, we're afraid. And so, you know, um, it's, it's crazy, but we can become sane again. We can become sane again. And so simple, awareness just takes the courage to be willing to feel what you're feeling. And you, you'll know it when you try it, but you got to try it. Got to try it. That's, that's the MO here, guys. So <laughs> I would love for you, Don, to tell us how to get a hold of the book. And also where they can find you online at the DeMello Spiritual Center, all of these things, because I'm pretty sure there's some folks that are going to be quite intrigued from this podcast and wanting to figure out what their next steps are and how they can get started. So give us this. Well, yes. They can get the book. It didn't fall down. It didn't. <laughs> they can get the book. Stop fixing yourself. Uh, uh, if they if actually if they type in stopfixingyourself.com all run word it'll take them to a, to our website where there are uh, s- several options you can use to buy it at Amazon or you know Barnes and Noble or whatever and people who go there uh, are will get a gift and the gift is a six part series of Anthony DeMello uh, conducting a workshop uh, at Fordham University back in 1986, and it's really a, it's really a wonderful um, workshop, and it goes really well with this book. So you get that for free, buying the book that way. Or if you just want to skip that and go right to Amazon, uh, you know, put in "Stop Fixing Yourself" and you find it there. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And where, where can folks find you with the DeMello Spiritual Center and, and things of that nature if they want to contact you to work with you directly? Well, they can go to uh, demellocenter.com and they can find me there. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Don, for taking the time out on a Saturday. It looks beautiful where you are. I see the sun shining and the leaves yeah. just blowing gently. And- <laughs> San Francisco Bay Area is where I am. Nice. You've got it's good. We've got a similar weather, gentle winds and, and sunny here up in Tacoma in Washington. So ah, <laughs> I love Washington. It's uh, yeah. a beautiful day. So we will let you get to it. But thank you so much for coming on. I look forward to chatting further about helping folks get that awareness going. And thank you for everything you're doing to help people. Really appreciate you. Hey, Health Junkies, I hope you enjoyed my podcast. If you want to continue the conversation based on what topic I'm talking about at any given time on the Health Fix podcast, head over to my Facebook group, Find Your Health Fix. It's where we are talking about what's going on in health, what I'm talking about in the podcast, and I love to answer questions there. So come hang out and join the conversation. And by the way, right now I have a free Manage Your Stress Naturally course that you can grab on my website at drjkrausnd.com because so many people are stressed out right now and really it has to do with the basics, your routines and simple habits that are messing you up. So head on over to drjkrausnd.com and go check out my free course on managing stress naturally. All right, folks, have a great day, whatever you're doing. 
subscribe, rate, and share info.